Asia, Japan, Kobe. Home to nearly one and a half million people, Kobe is famous for its breathtaking views. But land here is at a premium. Kobe is squeezed between the Rocco Mountains and the blue waters of Osaka Bay. The city center sits on a narrow strip of land just five kilometers wide. To the east and west lie densely populated residential areas of mostly traditional houses. And to the south, it's huge port area, built on a series of islands created by dumping millions of tons of soil into the sea. It's one of the world's biggest ports, handling $71 billion of cargo a year. To maximize precious space, 160 kilometers of Kobe's modern freeway system stand on pillars above the city. Monday, January 16th, 1995. It's a bright winter's day. The temperature just above freezing. Today is a national holiday, and Kobe bustles with people soaking up the holiday atmosphere. But beneath their feet, the ground is riddled with faults. These unstable cracks in the earth, 20 kilometers below the ground, are caused by movements of the Earth's surface. Japan is one of the world's most active earthquake zones. In Kobe, these faults stretch the length of the city center along the foot of the mountains. But Kobe is lucky. Fault activity is rare here. The city hasn't seen a major quake in 400 years. 10 kilometers east of the center is the residential area of Higashi Nada. Most of the houses here are of traditional Japanese design with a wooden frame and ornate roof tiles. In one of them, Built 50 years ago, lives 59-year-old Yukiko Shono. She shares her home with her son, Satoshi, and her dog. Her five-year-old granddaughter is staying with them for the holiday. Yukiko has lived in Kobe all her life. Her sole experience of earthquakes is just a couple of minor tremors. Earthquakes were something tiny. I can't even recall anything falling from the shelves, so I didn't think earthquakes were anything to be scared of. Thirty kilometers east of Kobe is the Osaka Earthquake Observatory. Here, scientists monitor part of a network of thousands of seismic sensors spread all over Japan. Tonight, Toshio Aremoto is on duty with a colleague. In 21 years, he's monitored several major earthquakes across the country. But today doesn't feel like a proper work day. Because it was a public holiday, I really felt like it was a day off. And I wasn't expecting anything unusual at all. 6.26 p.m. Their quiet shift is suddenly interrupted. An earth tremor measuring 3.6 on the Richter scale triggers the sensor network. Arimoto isn't phased. Japan clocks up a thousand earthquakes a year. And this one's tiny. Too small even to rattle the windows. 23 minutes later, ground shaking triggers the sensor network again. But this tremor is smaller still, measuring just 2.5. The sensors reveal that the tremors originate beneath the Akashi Channel, which separates Awaji Island from the mainland. It's 15 kilometers southwest of Kobe. In Kobe City, people are oblivious to the tremors. Shinchu, 400 kilometers northeast of Kobe. Tour bus driver Yoshio Fukumoto leaves town heading south. He's been driving buses for 30 years. I like driving, and in those days it was cool to be a tourist bus driver, so I really enjoyed it. Fukumoto's destination is Kobe. It's an overnight trip scheduled to take 12 hours. Six fifty-five. A third tremor. This one a 
The scientists are surprised to see three tremors in a matter of minutes, but Arimoto is still not alarmed. From the local seismic activity at the time, it really was unimaginable that a huge earthquake could occur in Kobe. In Yukiko Shono's home in Kobe, her granddaughter develops a fever. Yukiko rings her daughter, who agrees that the little girl should go home. Yukiko will not have her granddaughter staying with her tonight. 11.49 p.m. After nearly five hours of silence, a fourth tremor shakes the Akashi Channel. On average, there are five tremors exceeding magnitude 1.5 in a year. There have now been four in just under five and a half hours. 29-year-old Satoshi Shono keeps his mother Yukiko up past her bedtime. He's keen to show her his latest gadget, a laptop computer. We stayed up chatting for quite a while that evening. Then it turned midnight and he said, you should go to bed, Mum. I'll have to stay up until about two. Good night. Tuesday, January 17th, 5.45 a.m. Tour bus driver Yoshio Fukumoto is just 15 kilometers from the center of Kobe. Just three passengers remain on board. He's on the Hanshin Expressway, a 40-kilometer-long four-lane elevated freeway that runs right through Kobe. It's designed to be earthquake-proof, but like the rest of the city, it's never been put to the test. Fukumoto soon expects to be heading back to his family in nearby Kyoto. But then, after nearly six hours of inactivity, the ground beneath the Akashi Channel begins to move again, triggering the sensors in the earthquake observatory in Osaka. This time, it's more than just a tremor. January 17th, 1995, 5.46 a.m. At the fire station on Port Island in the Japanese city of Kobe, firefighter Makoto Fuji works the early shift. He's been on duty at the station for over 20 hours. 5.46 and 58 seconds. Fukumoto's routine journey takes an unexpected turn. Everything begins to shake violently. The freeway started to weave. I'd seen something like this in the movies, but I never thought I'd see the real thing. It's like driving on waves. I couldn't see properly, couldn't focus because of the bouncing. 4.5 kilometers west of Fukumoto's bus, 59-year-old grandmother Yukiko Shono wakes suddenly as the ground trembles beneath her house. At first it shook, like this, and I thought, it's an earthquake, a strong one, and then it stopped. And I thought, okay, it's just a tiny tremor. For a second, everything seems fine. It seems really weird, but there wasn't any sound. Then Yukiko Shono's world turns upside down. At the Port Island fire station, the earth begins to shake. It went right through my body. It felt as though the building would tear itself apart. Chairs and things on the desk crashed to the floor. Kobe is in the grip of a massive earthquake. A security camera at the regional office of TV channel NHK captures the violent shaking. It wakes a technician asleep on a camp bed. 
18 kilometers away on the swaying freeway, Fukumoto's bus could go right through the barriers and over the edge. He slams on the brakes. But just when the danger seems past, the road begins to move again. I pulled on the handbrake, and at that moment, the road in front of me just fell away. I really thought we'd fallen off the edge. I was paralyzed with fear. At the Port Island fire station, Makoto Fuji looks outside. He sees something incredible. A flood of water spurts up through gaping cracks in the ground. I didn't know what to think. Maybe this is a crack and the island is going to split in two. Or maybe it was a big water pipe that had broken under the ground. I just couldn't work it out. 30 kilometers away in the Osaka Observatory, Toshio Arimoto races to find the origin of the quake. It read Awaji Island, magnitude 7.2. Owaji Island sits on the edge of the Akashi Channel, just 15 kilometers from Kobe City. Arimoto is staggered. For the first time in four centuries, a massive earthquake has struck the Kobe area. 5.47 and 12 seconds. Just 14 seconds after the violent shuddering began, the earthquake subsides. Yoshio Fukumoto holds his breath. His bus teeters on the edge of the shattered freeway. The front wheels hang over a 15-meter drop. He's terrified that it will plunge to the ground. He must get the passengers off the bus. Yukiko Shono, trapped in the rubble of her home, gradually regains consciousness. But she's so dazed, she doesn't even realize where she is. I felt pain, as though my whole body had been shattered. I thought I had had a car accident, got hit by a car, and my body was paralyzed. That's what I thought. It was a car accident. Now, in Kobe's residential areas, there's a deadly new hazard. Fire. Hundreds lie trapped in the collapsed remains of their traditional wooden houses. Dawn light reveals the vast scale of the disaster. The quake knocked tower blocks to the ground. Toppled road bridges and flattened entire neighborhoods of traditional Japanese houses. Thousands of people lie dead and dying in the city's shattered remains. Under her crushed house, Yukiko Shono lies trapped and badly injured. The temperature is just above freezing. If rescuers don't come soon, the alternatives are grim. Freeze to death or be burnt alive. A magnitude 7.2 earthquake rips apart the Japanese city of Kobe. Thousands lie trapped and dying under wreckage. On the Hanshin Expressway, a tour bus narrowly escapes disaster. After getting his passengers safely off the bus, driver Yoshio Fukumoto is desperate to tell his company in Kyoto what's happened. So I phoned the office and said, the Hanjin Expressway has collapsed. The bus is just hanging off the edge. He told me to stop joking. Maybe it was a bit too early in the morning for him, but he sounded annoyed. The man tells Yoshio to go back and retrieve the bus's legal documents in case the bus falls over the edge. The guy just didn't understand what had happened. It was hard to believe. Dutifully, Yoshio returns to the precariously balanced bus. He inches towards the front and retrieves the documents. In the dawn light, Fukumoto takes pictures of his remarkable escape using a disposable camera. 
The way it was sticking out looked completely different from when we were up there. It was much more scary to look up from beneath, and I really wondered how I'd survived. It's a miraculous escape. Fukumoto walks away from his brush with death without a scratch. 4.5 kilometers from the stranded bus, 59-year-old Yukiko Shono isn't so lucky. She's been crushed beneath the wreckage of her home for over two hours. I couldn't breathe and I was choking and sweating. I thought the only release from this agony would be to die. I wondered how I could kill myself. Kobe's emergency services struggle to cope with the scale of the disaster. Emergency vehicles find it almost impossible to move around the city's debris-clogged streets. 8.30 a.m. Yukiko's daughter, Kumiko, arrives in her mother's traditional neighborhood with her husband. Her own more modern home survived the quake. She and her little daughter escaped unhurt. But she's horrified to find that where her mother's house stood is just a shattered pile of timber and roof tiles. She realizes her mother and brother must lie beneath the tons of debris. At that point, I thought they were probably dead because I couldn't believe a person could survive under that rubble. Ruptured gas mains fuel fires raging across the city. But the quake also breaks many of the water mains, leaving firefighters helpless in the face of the inferno. They pump water straight from the sea, but it's a frustratingly slow process. There is no water, and having no water at the fire was deadly. I just felt really helpless. Everything I had learned before was no use at all in the earthquake. 2.30 p.m. In the region where Yukiko Shono lives, many of the traditional wooden houses are ablaze. And the fires are spreading. She becomes increasingly desperate. I was in such agony. I couldn't move my right arm at all because it was trapped. But I found this piece of wood. With my left hand, I started to make a banging noise. Outside, Yukiko's daughter hears something. It's not her mother, but her mother's dog. Kumiko is certain the dog is trying to tell her something. She barked and stopped, barked and stopped, and kept staring at my face. Then she barks again, and when she stops, I can hear a tapping noise. So I called out, Mother, Mother, and we heard a tapping response, and we realized she was still alive. Kumiko finds some construction workers. They help her dig towards the sounds of the tapping. It's slow work. One wrong move, and the wreckage could crash down and kill her mother. Two hours later, they finally reached Yukiko. She's been buried for 10 hours. Her right leg is paralyzed. Her hip is broken. But she is alive. Finding her mother gives Kumiko new hope. Her younger brother, Satoshi, could be alive too, somewhere under the debris. She calls out, but he doesn't answer. They start to dig again. Five hours later, they find him, but it's too late. When they checked my brother's pulse, they told me he didn't make it. Hmm. 
It was the most shocking thing that's ever happened to me. That evening, Kumiko has to break it to her mother that her beloved son is dead. He was just 29 years old. So my daughter told me that Satoshi didn't make it, and I couldn't speak. I just said, I see. I cried underneath my quilt after she left, making sure that my tears couldn't be seen from the outside. Yukiko Shono's son is just one of 5,502 people killed. More than 235,000 people are homeless. More than 100,000 buildings destroyed. The quake wrecks electricity and water systems. The damage tops $150 billion. It's the world's most costly disaster. It overwhelmed the city's emergency services and help from the national government took almost two days to arrive. Japan prides itself on its ability to build earthquake-proof buildings. So why does their city lie in ruins? And why didn't scientists predict a major quake? The population of Kobe wants answers. 24 separate teams of experts embark on a wide-ranging investigation of the disaster. Seismologists will explore the quake itself, while engineering experts probe the failure of buildings and structures. Now, by rewinding the disaster and by going deep into the investigation, we reveal what really happened at Kobe. How so many people died and why the quake left the city looking like a war zone. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the Kobe disaster. Earthquake expert Professor Charles Scorthorne is one of the first on the scene. By a remarkable coincidence, he was attending an earthquake conference just 30 kilometers from Kobe and actually felt the quake. He quickly realizes that this is an earthquake of colossal proportions. This was the most significant earthquake of the second half of the 20th century. This was a direct hit on uh, as modern a society as you can have in the world. And, um, it was totally devastated. Japanese experts working with him cannot believe the scale of the destruction. My Japanese colleagues really were having a difficult time because they just did not expect this. It, it may be like Americans on 9-11. This was something that was uh, um, shocking. Earthquakes are a fact of life in Japan. 13 major quakes have hit the country in the last 100 years, killing over 150,000 people. The country sits on the boundaries of four massive tectonic plates. As these plates shift, the movement triggers quakes along a network of thousands of fault lines under Japan. Kobe lies 200 kilometers north of the nearest plate boundary, called the Nankai Trough. So major quakes in the region are very rare. But this time, tectonic movement at this boundary is big enough to reach Kobe. Seismic equipment reveals that the quake is magnitude 7.2, powerful enough to be picked up by sensors on the other side of the planet. The quake scores a direct hit on Kobe City. But scientists are puzzled to find that its original epicenter is 15 kilometers away. It doesn't seem to make any sense. This should put Kobe outside the zone of severe damage. So what did cause the destruction in Kobe City? January 17th, 1995. A magnitude 7.2 earthquake devastates the Japanese city of Kobe. The quake's epicenter is under Awaji Island in a fault well known to seismologists. But a quake here should only cause serious damage in Awaji. It cannot explain the scale of the devastation 15 kilometers away in Kobe. This could only be caused by a fault rupturing directly under the city. Experts analyze hundreds of sensor readings from the Kobe quake. 
and discover a shocking fact. There's a subterranean fault line beneath the Akashi Channel that scientists were completely unaware of. Previous surveys didn't pick it up. It's not large, but it links the Owaji Fault to a fault directly under Kobe. January 16th, 11.49 p.m. The series of small quakes that Toshio Arimoto sees in the Osaka Earthquake Observatory are not just harmless tremors. It's the ground on either side of the fault line beginning to shift 15 kilometers beneath the surface of Awaji Island. 5.46 a.m. and 52 seconds. Scientists are now certain that the violence of the Awaji earthquake triggers a chain reaction through the undiscovered fault. The quake now races along this fault towards Kobe at 9,000 kilometers per hour. Six seconds later, the fault under the city ruptures. It's a direct hit. The earthquake goes off with the energy of a 65 kiloton nuclear bomb. Even if Arimoto had known about the undiscovered fault line, the initial tremors don't necessarily indicate that a quake is imminent. I suppose if you look at it afterwards, you could see it as a foreshock. But there's no way to predict there's going to be a huge disaster from just observing a bunch of tremors. Even today, it remains impossible to predict an earthquake. It's clear how the quake scores a direct hit on Kobe. Now investigators must focus on another puzzle. Why did more than 5,000 people die in the disaster, in a country that's renowned for building earthquake-proof cities? When investigators analyze the pattern of fatalities, they discover that the overwhelming majority of deaths occur in the city's suburbs. Here, whole streets of traditional timber-framed Japanese houses simply collapse. 4,900 of the quake's victims die in this type of house. The investigators' first priority is to find out why. They examine the design. They find that these types of houses are simply constructed using a series of timber supports. But topping this lightweight structure is an ornate tiled roof. A Japanese house has a heavy uh, roof, so you're supporting tons of uh, roofing on really just little spindly columns. One of these roofs weighs two tons. In a modern timber house, solid walls help to brace the wooden supports. But investigators discover that walls in these older houses are made of plaster and bamboo, which have no structural strength. The unbraced posts provide the only support for the heavy roof. When the earthquake strikes, there is nothing to stop the structure swaying and then caving in. It's called a pancake collapse. As the heavy roof pancakes down, it crushes the floors below. And anyone unfortunate enough to be inside. It causes nearly 9 out of 10 of the deaths in Kobe. What killed everyone in Kobe, almost everyone, was the Japanese house. And the Japanese house is a killer. But if the structure is so weak, why top them with such heavy roofs? The investigators discover an appalling irony. The heavy roofs are built to resist a natural disaster. Not earthquakes, but typhoons. On average, Kobe is hit by more than two of these destructive tropical storms every year. Five forty-six and fifty-eight seconds. Yukiko Shono's typhoon-proof house is no match for the devastating power of the Kobe quake. The house simply collapses, crushing her and killing her son. 
The heavy roofs, the very feature that might save lives in a typhoon, prove a death sentence in an earthquake. While the death toll is highest in the traditionally built suburbs, investigators find ample evidence of severe structural damage elsewhere in Kobe City. And investigators are puzzled why so many of Kobe's modern structures also collapse. These should be constructed to building codes specifically designed to withstand a major earthquake. There is no more potent symbol of this failure than the collapsed Route 3 of the Hanshin Expressway. It's 40 kilometers long, elevated above ground level by hundreds of concrete pillars. The quake damages or destroys over half of them. It also topples 26 of its 1,304 sections of roadway. Built in 1969, it was a key transport artery carrying more than 180,000 cars a day. Its loss cripples Kobe's transport system. The Japanese Ministry of Construction orders an investigation. Engineer Hirokazu Emura is one of the principal investigators. The amount of damage astounds him. Honestly speaking, we did not expect such a total collapse of the bridges because we design bridges with the highest seismic force in the world. So we had been thinking that our structure is the strongest. Imura and the team are mystified. The Hanshin was designed to withstand a magnitude 8.1 earthquake, 22 times as powerful as the magnitude 7.2 quake that decimates it. The public clamors for answers. Were corners cut during the Hanshin's construction? The first criticism we heard from the citizens is there could have been mistakes made in the construction. Emura knows that Japanese civil engineering is under the microscope. We wanted to show citizens that we did not make any mistakes in the construction. The team begins a forensic examination. One of the key failures is in the eastern suburbs, where Yoshio Fukumoto's bus had a lucky escape. A whole section of roadway has simply fallen off its pillar. It leaves the bus teetering on the very edge of a 15-meter drop. Investigators know this should not be possible. Each 52-meter long section is securely bolted to the pillars by cast iron fixings 190 millimeters thick. But when they check the fixings, they discover that the earthquake's violence has sheared them apart. It leaves the slabs of road resting loosely on top of the pillars. But the team still can't understand why the sections of road fall. A single 965-ton slab, like the one beneath Fukumoto's bus, would have to slide 120 centimeters to drop off its pillar. They're convinced that the earthquake alone could not cause such extreme movement. Emura and the team re-inspect the road sections. Then, on the faces of the 33-millimeter thick steel girders that support the roadway, they spot something. The thick steel has been smashed and bent. The investigators realize this damage is caused by the 965-ton girders crashing into each other. These violent impacts act like gigantic hammer blows that force the slabs of road over the edge. 5.46 and 58 seconds. As the quake begins, the steel fixings supporting the slabs of road snap. The sliding slabs crash together, pushing one another across the tops of the pillars. Fukumoto is now driving on a road surface that slides back and forth beneath his bus. Fukumoto screeches to a halt. His front wheels rest on a road section teetering on the edge of its pillar. Then it slips the last few centimeters and crashes over the edge. If Fukumoto had stopped a few meters further on, his bus would have plummeted 15 meters. Chances of survival would have been slim. 
The way it was ticking out, I really wondered how we survived. But Fukumoto and his passengers are even luckier than they thought. Had the quake happened just minutes later, he would have traveled 4.5 kilometers further along the Han Shin. Here, the quake topples a stretch of roadway more than half a kilometer long. And it looks almost like a giant child's toy that's laid over on its side. The girder fixings here are intact. This time, the quake has fractured the concrete pillars themselves. How did they fail? Imura and the team inspect the pillars. They find that three layers of steel bars reinforce them. It's a routine building technique. The two outer layers run all the way from top to bottom, but the inner layer stops 1.5 meters above ground level. Photographs taken during the investigation show these shorter bars sticking out of the shattered concrete. This is exactly where the pillars fail. As the ground shakes, the roadway begins to sway. Its vast weight puts immense stress on the pillars. Seconds later, the pillars snap at their weakest point, where the inner layer of reinforcing bars ends. The heavy roadway crashes to the ground. Investigators work out that if the inner reinforcing bars had not been made short like this, the Hanshin might have survived the quake. It's clear that major elements of the Hanshin structure were highly vulnerable. But it was built to strict building codes introduced in 1964. Codes that should have ensured it could withstand a much bigger quake. So why did they fail? Sensor data reveals that the epicenter was unusually shallow, just 15 kilometers below the surface. That made the ground acceleration, the violence of the movement, especially severe. But in 1964, experts had very little data on this phenomenon. Investigators discover that the ground acceleration in the Kobe quake was more than twice as violent as the 1964 building codes allowed for. It's this that causes such severe damage to the Hanshin and so many of Kobe's other modern structures. Now we knew from the results that the design method at the time was not correct. The Japanese government updated the codes three times after the Hanshin was built, but the new rules only applied to new structures, not existing ones. Investigators are starting to find out why the Kobe quake is so devastating and so deadly. How traditional Japanese houses are a death sentence for thousands. Why so many modern structures are annihilated. And how the quake scores a direct hit on the city, leaving its citizens seconds from disaster. Twenty seconds from disaster. An earthquake strikes the northern tip of Awaji Island. It tears open a previously unknown fault nearby. Now the quake races along the fault at 9,000 kilometers per hour and heads straight for Kobe. 14 seconds to disaster. The fault right under the city ruptures with cataclysmic force. It shakes the Hanshin Expressway like a rag doll. Steel fixing shear and whole sections of the road crash to the ground. It leaves Fukumoto's bus hanging over an abyss. 4.5 kilometers away, it snaps inadequately reinforced concrete pillars, downing over half a kilometer of roadway. And in hundreds of traditional houses to the east and west, it kills nearly 5,000 people as their heavy roofs crash down on top of them. Just 20 seconds after the first seismic activity, the earthquake subsides. It leaves the city of Kobe a shattered, blazing ruin. But the investigators have one puzzle still to solve. What caused the widespread subsidence in the devastated port area?
Could the mysterious eruptions of muddy water reported by witnesses be a crucial clue? The Kobe quake savages the city's economy. The worst impact is felt in Kobe's vital docks area. It's so badly damaged, it's out of action for over two years, wiping out some $40 billion of Kobe's vital trade. Investigators find that the damage here looks different from the rest of the city. In places, the ground has dramatically subsided, and nine kilometers of concrete dockside has fallen into the sea. Investigators learn that eyewitnesses like firefighter Makoto Fuji report a flood of water during the quake. Not from the sea, but erupting out of the ground. It was about a meter high and maybe 10 meters wide. At first, when I saw the wall of water bursting through the ground, I didn't know what to think. It's a crucial clue. Investigators suspect that Fuji witnessed an unusual phenomenon that can be caused by major quakes. Niigata in north central Japan, 1964. This original film shows a slurry of muddy water erupting out of the ground during a quake. It was the first time this phenomenon had been captured on film. It undermines the foundations of buildings, causing severe damage. The phenomenon is now known as liquefaction. It happens when a quake strikes ground saturated with water, just like the land beneath Kobe's Port Island. Port Island is built on land reclaimed from the sea in Kobe's harbor. City authorities dumped 80 million cubic meters of sandy soil from the Rocco Mountains over an area of 4.5 square kilometers. The 14-year project was completed in 1980. The landfilled area would usually be a perfectly reliable base for buildings, but just below the surface, it's loosely packed and saturated with water. Five forty-six a.m. and 58 seconds. When the earthquake strikes, the shock waves shake Port Island's loose, sandy soil. If you take a can of coffee, coffee grounds, and you tap it, you know the coffee grounds will settle. Well, sand is very much the same way, and if the, the earthquake taps it, that ground will settle. The gaps between the loosely packed sand grains are filled with water. The quake compacts the grains tightly, forcing the water up towards the surface under terrific pressure. What Fuji sees is not a broken water main, but a flood of liquefied soil. Investigators conclude that wide-scale liquefaction of reclaimed land is what destroys much of Kobe's port. In the wake of the disaster, city authorities rebuild Kobe using the latest earthquake-proofing technology. They spend $6.8 billion on the port alone, rebuilding the dock walls with much deeper foundations to resist any future quake. Modern houses with solid walls and light roofs replace the flattened neighborhoods of traditional homes. And the elevated expressways get a $3 billion upgrade, with more reinforcing bars and steel sheathing on the columns. Yoshio Fukumoto still drives buses. His lucky escape made him Japan's most famous bus driver. But news of earthquakes still sends chills down his spine. When I see earthquakes today, I feel a raw pain. I'm very frightened of earthquakes. Yukiko Shono still lives in Kobe, on the site of the house where her son Satoshi died. Yukiko now gives public talks, advising people how to be prepared if an earthquake strikes. If that saves even one more life at the next disaster, this is the least I can do for those who died. If there is a world beyond this one, 
When I get to where my son is, I can at least smile and proudly tell him, Mummy has done well. After the Kobe disaster, Japan's government introduced a national disaster strategy to ensure fast response by rescuers and equipment in the event of a major quake. When a magnitude 6.8 quake hit the city of Niigata in 2004, special rescue teams were on the scene within hours. The Kobe disaster forced the Japanese to reappraise just how earthquake-proof their cities really are. They can't change their earthquake-prone country, but the lessons learned from Kobe will save thousands of lives when another major earthquake strikes.